touted as a racial democracy. I'm very proud to be black in Brazil. It is one of the most diverse countries in the world. There are over 100 categories that people use themselves to describe what color they are. Put your hands right. You're all different colors. But is everyone equal? We have to live in a racial democracy that doesn't exist. There is no equality. Brazil, a racial paradise, black in Latin America. During Carnival, in splendid excess, Brazil celebrates its multicultural roots. But in Salvador de Bahia, Brazil's African heritage comes to the fore. Echoing ancient African rituals, the Maya de Santo, the mother of the spirits, throws popcorn to the crowd, symbolizing offerings to the Yoruba gods to ensure a peaceful Carnival. Incredibly, 4.8 million slaves arrived here from Africa, and a million and a half landed here in Bahia. Dreamed about coming to Bahia, read about Bahia, fantasized about Bahia. But the most astonishing thing to me, having come to Bahia, is how very close to Africa this all is. Nothing, no matter what I've read, prepares me for this sense of immediacy and intimacy with the African continent. The slaves who came to South America did not sail alone. They brought their religion, they brought their gods, and they brought their music. Today, more than 75 million people of African descent live in Brazil, making it the second largest black population in the world. I'm here to learn their story. Salvador is Brazil's third largest city and its blackest. So there's no better place to begin my journey. Brazil is a study in contradictions. On the one hand, it was the last country in the Western Hemisphere to abolish slavery. But on the other hand, it was also the first to claim that it was free of racism, proudly declaring itself to be a racial democracy. It's a hybrid nation, and its people are descended from Africans, Europeans, and the original indigenous inhabitants. In the United States, a person with any African ancestry is legally defined as black. Hey, my brother, how you doing? I mean, I want to ask you something. In Brazil, racial categories are on steroids. Here, my color is in the eye of the beholder. So if I lived in Brazil, what color would I be? I know. So, what? What? Take a good look. Oh, I think you would be or mulato or cafuso. Okay. What color are you? Negra. Negra. What color are you? Negro also. Negro also. Negro também. Negro. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, look, give me your hand. Look, look, no, no, no. Put your hands right. You're all different colors. So you can't all be Negro. Ah, okay, now you're talking. And the good thing is, we're all black. There are over 100 categories that people use themselves to describe what color they are. When I ask them what their color is, what their race is, they describe it in the way 
that you would describe the colors in the rainbow. So it's a great learning experience for me, particularly as an American, where race is weighted in a dramatically different way. Brazil's long heritage of racial mixing has its roots deep in slavery. About 500 years ago, the Portuguese imported sugar to Brazil. They also imported African slaves to work what became the largest sugar plantation economy in the entire world. Almost half of all the Africans brought to the New World between 1502 and 1867 came here to Brazil. Almost five million people. Why did so many more slaves come here than anywhere else in the Americas? João Hayes, professor of history at Bahia's Federal University, is an expert on the history of Brazilian slavery. Ten times more Africans came to Brazil than came to the United States in the entire history of the slave trade. That's correct. Why? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's simple. The Portuguese, they uh, controlled a lot of the, uh, of the ports where the slave trade uh, happened. And um, also the, uh, the voyages were shorter than going to the Caribbean and then to the U.S. All these uh, factors combined result in a very intense slave trade. Portuguese planters could easily and cheaply obtain African slaves and they needed large numbers of these slaves to satisfy the world's growing craving for sugar. Easy access and brutal working conditions created a dramatically different slave economy here than the one that evolved in the United States. The American uh, planters did not have this easy access to the sources of uh, slave production in Africa. Because of this, they were materially better treated than they were in Brazil. Mm -hmm. They were better housed, better clothed, better uh, fed, uh, and the institution of slavery was uh, promoted there. Nothing of this sort happened in, in, uh, in Brazil. Well, in Brazil, you could replace the Africans. It, exactly. And it was cheaper to replace them than to perpetuate them. Exactly. I knew how barbaric slavery was in the U.S., but it was even worse in Brazil. For the Portuguese, slavery meant enormous wealth, and Salvador became one of the grandest cities in the entire New World. The pride of Salvador was the Church of São Francisco Convent, one of the finest examples of Baroque architecture in Brazil. Construction of the church began in 1708 with the labor of slaves and free blacks. One ton of solid gold leaf was used to cover the sculptures of saints and angels that adorn its splendid interior. Such an astonishingly opulent way to worship God. An opulence built on the profits of sugar resting on the backs of African slaves. While forcibly constructing their master's culture, the African slaves creatively nurtured their own. I've come to Valle das Pedrinhas, the home of one of the city's best-known capoeira schools. Capoeira, part martial art, part dance, is one of the most elegant ways in which the slaves created a new culture in the cities, transforming African forms as they adjusted to slavery. Nice. 
A meeting with Master Bual Gente, one of the most respected capoeira masters in Brazil. He trained this troupe. Hello, Master. Bual Gente runs a community radio station, and today I'm a guest on his show. I am a professor of African and African American culture, and I love um, black culture all over the world and study it. And I wanted to come to a country where everyone looked like me. And when I came, they said, you have to meet one person, said, Master Boa Genchi. Oh, how wonderful. Because you are the man. You too. You are the man also. Master Boal Gente uses capoeira to keep young people off the streets, here in one of Salvador's poorest and most violent neighborhoods. And he's proud of its African roots. What um, role did capoeira play among the slaves? Why did the slaves develop capoeira? The slave owners didn't want black people to organize themselves. In the coffee plantation, in the sugar plantation, weapons were not allowed, but the black people were tortured and needed a way to defend themselves. And they discovered in capoeira a way to strengthen and defend themselves. Capoeira was a form of training designed for self-defense. If the slaves were caught practicing a martial art, they could be punished. Capoeira allowed them to disguise their training as a dance. They would be there training. And then they'd hear the cavalry coming. But there would be a lookout, a capoeirista, hidden, watching. And when he saw them, he'd start playing to the sound of the cavalry. <laughs> So, when they saw the cavalry, suddenly everything would change from a fight to a dance. So the cavalry would turn up and they would see all the black people doing their samba. So they would pretend. <laughs> and the cavalry would say, oh, the blacks are playing around, they are dancing, and they'd start clapping. So this was a way to trick the cavalry. And when the cavalry left, they'd carry on. <laughs> it's difficult to believe that this man is 65 years old. <laughs> <laughs> You're the man. <laughs> I need you. I need you to come to Boston and protect me. <laughs> you protect me. <laughs> Welcome to Vale das Pedrinhas, Salvador, Bahia, Brazil. Thank you. You can feel the presence of Africa around every corner in Salvador and see it written right on the people's faces. This is Candomblé, a religion invented in Brazil, but based on the gods that the slaves brought with them from Angola, Nigeria, and Dahomey. Just up the street from Master Bualgente's Capoeira School, still in the favela, but I feel like I could be in an African city. Yeah. 
cacho show, it's so damn damn long. It's a cacho show. It's like a fair. Father Joao runs this temple, one of more than 1,100 devoted to Condomble in Salvador. I like the fact that you are keeping African gods alive. Is this important to you? It is very important to me. I was born into a religious family. My mother was very religious. When I was seven years old, the spirit became a part of me. At 14, it came to me again. And by the age of 16, I was in charge of a temple. I'm now 49 years old. I never think about stopping. I just think about evolving and growing. I have the sons of the temple here. We raise them. So if tomorrow I'm not here, they can continue the religion, which is rich and true. In many ways, the story of Candomblé is the story of the mixing of cultures in Brazil. Slaves from different ethnic groups and different parts of Africa fuse their different religions and the Yoruba gods into a compelling new blend. They even incorporated elements of Catholicism to create a new religion, Condomble. And it's this mixing of cultures and ethnicities that so defines Brazil. Looking at the people on the streets in Salvador, I don't think I've ever been anywhere with so many brown faces. And the reasons for this go back to the very beginnings of the slave trade. People who came to colonize Brazil were adventurous. You know, bachelors or people who left their families uh, in Portugal with the dream of going back there. And, uh, and so there was a very, you know, important shortage of uh, white women, Portuguese women. That uh, produced a very large uh, mixed, uh, you know, race uh, population. Race uh, is not often an obstacle to sex. Marriages, mm -hmm. stable relationships, having children and building families, but sex. <laughs> <laughs> sex. And I think that's everywhere, sex. not only in Brazil. <laughs> sex is, in other words, sex is colorblind. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm heading for the mountains of Minas Gerais in Brazil's interior to find out how all this racial mixing began. In the High Sierra lies the perfectly preserved colonial town of Giamanchina, built in the 1700s to service some of Brazil's richest diamond mines located just outside of town. While slavery in the 16th and 17th centuries was all about sugar, in the 18th century, it was mainly about gold and diamond mining. Life for the slaves here was a world away from that of their sisters and brothers down on the sugar plantations. In Giamanchina, blacks and whites lived side by side. This town was built around 1710. Uh, Professor Zunia Furtado has written the definitive history of slavery in Giamanchina. Who would have lived up here? Uh, we don't know exactly who lived, but we know that uh, in the same street lived uh, white people and black uh, freed people and mulatto freed people. All over the city? All over the city, living in these larger streets, in nice houses like this one. Uh, with chapels on the house. I wouldn't mind owning this today, fix up, <laughs> yeah. get a little chapel. <laughs> <laughs> the black people that lived in these comfortable houses weren't slaves at all. They had been freed. Some had earned enough from mining or even from prostitution to buy their own freedom. Some were the concubines of white men, set free by their lovers, often on their deathbeds. In the United States, of course, we had communities of free blacks, 
but generally they would live together, segregated, and then the whites would be someplace else. Why do you think uh, here they were integ so integrated? integrated? I think, first of all, uh, they were very distant from everywhere where else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, even nowadays, it's difficult to come here. Uh, imagine in the 18th century, uh, it was months to travel to here. <laughs> so these people were pretty much apart from the rest of the world. What did the church think about all this? Of course, the church uh, <laughs> disapproved completely this kind of uh, situation. But uh, what we see more here was a kind of silence of the church. And uh, there were some visits of the bishop here. And when the bishop comes, all these <laughs> sins were denounced. But, but as the, the bishop left the, the city, everybody started uh, living together <laughs> with everybody. <laughs> so the bishop would come, they would be denounced, they'd have to confess and they'd have to say, I won't do it again. I won't do it again, <laughs> but as soon as he leaves... They'd say, is the bishop gone? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Come on back. Come on back to the house. <laughs> Junior took me to the house of Giamanchina's most famous citizen, a woman named Chica da Silva. Chica da Silva, an 18th century slave, was the partner of a white diamond merchant, and once freed, became one of the wealthiest women in all of Giamanchina. Today, she's known all over Brazil. Eu te dou muito mais do que a liberdade. Eu te dou tudo que os diamantes do Tijuco podem comprar. Mas se gostasse de mim de verdade, me dava uma carta de alforria. E correr o risco de você me deixar? Eu não. Quem ama mesmo de verdade tem que correr todo o risco. Tá bem. Amanhã eu mando preparar a carta de alforria. A popular film starring the famous black actress Zezé Mata was even made of her life in the 1970s. <laughs> Tell me about how she went from being a slave to being one of the most powerful women in her society. She was uh, a companion of someone who was the most important man here. He arrived in August, and in, in December, he already belonged to him and he freed her. On Christmas Day. On Christmas Day. It That's, was a Christmas gift. That's amazing. And they stayed together. And they stayed together for 15 years. And they had 13 children together, one after the other. So the, the generation will be uh, secured. <laughs> She pretended like uh, she was, she acted like a white woman. Mm -hmm. She to dress like them. Like, dressed like them, have uh, several children, uh, buried in a white church. In other words, she had to erase her African heritage. Yes. What about her children? Did they uh, embrace their blackness or did they pass for white? No. They really embrace the whiteness. <laughs> <laughs> because it's the way of social climbing in this society. Mm -hmm. The thing was become uh, white people. Mm -hmm. A woman is born a slave, and she dies one of the most prosperous, prominent members of her community. She and her white lover live openly and together have and raise 13 children. She dies a wealthy woman. No slave in the history of that institution in the United States could imagine a life as complex as that lived by Chica da Silva. The difference between slavery in Brazil and slavery in the United States is this. Here, she could almost escape her blackness. Is black beautiful to black Brazilian women today? To find out, I've come to Belo Horizonte, the capital of Minas Gerais State.
Dora Alves, a black activist and hairdresser, is trying to reverse the tendency of black women to straighten their hair, to conform to Brazilian society's ideals of beauty. Sometimes we will have someone arrive at the salon and they are so depressed with such a low self-esteem. They think that their hair is ugly, that their hair is terrible. Sometimes the mother still has her baby in the pushchair and she arrives asking me, oh my God, is there any way to save this hair? When we go into schools, a teacher might come to me with a child and whisper in my ear, do you think there is anything that can be done? <laughs> Dora campaigns in schools and community centers to increase pride in African features and natural hairstyles. Why do so many black women have low self-esteem here in Brazil if they have um, Afro hair? It's a question of history. It's also a question of the media. You can see it in the adverts, the magazines, the TV. Most of the women you see are white with straight hair. There might be one black girl, just one. And the rest are white with the hair straightened out, so black women can't see themselves at all. I've returned to Salvador, Brazil's black capital, to find out what in this country's past made attitudes toward blackness so problematic. The Society for the Protection of the Needy is Bahia's oldest Afro-Brazilian organization. Founded in 1832, its members, free black men, raised funds to purchase the freedom of slaves. While some slaves managed to buy their freedom, slavery as an institution wasn't abolished here until 1888, making Brazil the last country in the New World to do so. Even then, abolition didn't usher in the dramatic transformation that many Afro-Brazilians had hoped. When slavery was abolished, what did the white elite think about the legacy of African culture in Brazil? Uh, what bothered them, or the biggest problem, was how to deal with the population of color. Various intellectuals believed for Brazil to become a civilized country, it had to have a process of whitening. For this reason, the government invested a great deal in European immigration to the country. The Brazilian government paid for more than 4 million Europeans to migrate to Brazil. This was part of a process known as branqueamento, whitening. The government hoped that these new immigrants would outnumber the black people and breed with them, over time whitening the face of Brazil, both its gene pool and its culture. From then on, the government began to persecute practices that were seen as black, like candomblé and capoeira, trying to convince people that these practices were barbaric and that it was a civilizing act to stop them. In Bahia, one man staunchly protested against these racist policies. Historian, artist, labor unionist and black activist, Manuel Corino. What was new or bold about what Quirino had to say? Quirino emphasized the great role of the African as a civilizer, as a worker. He thought there was no need for immigrants as Brazil had already been civilized by Africans. So he was a dissonant voice when everyone was saying that those who came as slaves weren't capable of a more sophisticated style of work. At a time when the elite was trying to whitewash Brazilian history, this man took a courageous stand. He insisted that the black presence in Brazil was fundamental to its cultural 
and societal identity. As a scholar of African American studies, this is like meeting for the first time W.E.B. Du Bois or Carter G. Woodson, the fathers of African American history. Professor Vlamira Albuquerque passionately wants to return Corino to his rightful place in the pantheon of great Brazilian intellectuals. Vlamira has brought me to Bahia's Geographic and Historical Institute, which houses first editions of Corino's writings. Do you have a favorite passage of Corino that you like? Yes, I'll have a look. Mm. Okay. Whoever reads history will see how the nation has gloried through the Africans it imported. Oh, the glory of Africa. Mm. This makes me feel really good. It makes me feel a part of something that should be celebrated, not something I should feel ashamed of. So you're very proud of the <laughs> black... Yes, I'm very proud to be black in Brazil. Yeah. Quirino died in 1923. His ideas largely ignored. The creation of Brazil's official identity as one of the world's first truly mixed, supposedly racist-free nations, proud of its African heritage, is credited to a white scholar. I've come to Pernambuco, north of Bahia, the home state of Brazil's most famous intellectual, Gilberto Freire. Even the airport is named after him. Born in 1900, Freire spent much of his boyhood on a sugar plantation owned by his mother's relatives. In his classic work, Masters and Slaves, published in 1933, Freire argued that race relations on Brazilian plantations were far more fluid than in the United States. Portuguese masters were more willing to have open, extended sexual relations and to father children with their slaves. According to Freire, this open racial mixing created a society largely free of the deep racial animosity found in the United States, where sexual relations between masters and slaves were illicit, furtive, and frowned upon. In this passage, Freire says that black Brazilians and white Brazilians are inextricably intertwined, that in effect, they create each other. Listen to this. Every Brazilian, even the light-skinned, fair-haired one, carries about him on his soul, when not on soul or body alike, the shadow, or at least the birthmark of the aborigine or the Negro in our affections, our excessive mimicry, our Catholicism, which so delights the senses, our music, our gait, our speech, our cradle songs, in everything that is a sincere expression of our lives, we almost all of us bear the mark of that influence. Can you imagine how this played in America in 1933 under Jim Crow segregation? It must have shocked them to death. You don't have to agree with Freire's view of plantation life, which today seems rather naive about rape and sexual coercion, to recognize the astonishing impact that his thesis had on Brazil's official image of itself. Freire lived in this house in Recife between 1940 and his death in 1987. Gee, wow, look at this. Yeah, some, uh, some uh, medals yeah. of honors. <laughs> and the first edition of uh, mm. Portuguese that... first edition, mm. 1933. Hmm. Freire's grandson believes that his work is the key to understanding contemporary Brazilian race relations. 
Aqui é o This is the great creating space for Gilberto Freire. This is where he'd work. He'd sit on this chair and write, surrounded by his books. How do you think attitudes toward black people in Brazil changed after your grandfather's book was published? I think that Masters and Slaves was a real turning point, a rupture which occurred in Brazil in the 1930s when the book was published. Gilberto raises the Brazilian blacks to the same cultural standing as the Portuguese, who came here to build Brazil. He puts the Portuguese and the blacks on the same level. He says Brazil only became Brazil when African culture became culturally miscegenated and started to contribute to Brazilian unity. I don't think we have solved the racial question, but uh, I think that we are more advanced in solving the racial question than any other community in the world that I know. Brazilian governments, since the 1930s, have drawn upon Freire's ideas to unify Brazil's multi-ethnic society. Brazil's policy of whitening was replaced with a new ideology, which Freire called racial democracy. The multicultural heritage of Carnival became Brazil's new metaphor for itself. To this day, Brazil promotes itself as a unique, truly multicultural nation, blessedly free of the racism that haunts the United States. But on my journey through Brazil, I've begun to sense that the reality of race relations is far more complicated than this romantic story would have it, as appealing as I find it to be. I've come to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil's most iconic city and its cultural and intellectual capital. I've come here to meet Brazil's first black female superstar, the actor who 35 years ago played the title role in the film of the life of Chica da Silva. Hello. Hello. Good morning, how are you? Chica is the symbol of the roots of Brazil's racial democracy and its history of racial mixing. <laughs> you have a beautiful, beautiful oh, place. You. My God. But the reality for the actress who played her was quite different. The producer didn't want me to do the film because he thought I was too ugly. <laughs> Until very recently in Brazil, black people were all considered ugly. <laughs> of course, Zezé Mata got the part. But even with her new status, she painfully learned that the idea that Brazil was free of racism rang hollow. After the film, I was considered a Brazilian sex symbol because the character became very present in the male imagination. At this time, there would never be a black person on the cover of the big magazines, because they would say the cover sells. But as I had become the queen, the sex symbol, an important magazine put me on the cover, and someone high up in the magazine said, if it didn't sell, the person who signed it off would be fired. Essa pessoa que fez a capa vai ser despedida. A Chica da Silva também. Chica da Silva brought me into activism, an activist, a fervent activist for the black movement. I traveled to 16 countries promoting the film, including the US. And when I got back, I began to think, where is everybody? There were so few black actors in the media. I think the country has a debt to black people and needs to be corrected so that Brazil can rehabilitate itself for blacks.
when you look around the wealthier parts of Rio, you can't help but wonder if anything really has changed. Very few black faces here. And if you look at the covers of magazines at any newsstand, you notice the same prejudice experienced by Zeze Mata. You'd never know that this newsstand was in Brazil. Nothing but white women on the cover of these magazines. You feel the presence of Afro-Brazilians most in the poorest neighborhoods in Rio. I've come to the City of God, one of Rio's most infamous favelas, to see what life is really like for far too many of Brazil's 75 million people of African descent. Hello. MV Bill should know he's lived here all his life. He's Brazil's most famous rapper. Why do you live here? In America, the hip hop stars, as soon as they can, they move to Beverly Hills. <laughs> they say, City of God, bye bye. Non condeno. <laughs> I don't condemn those who make money, leave the ghetto and go to live somewhere else. But my thing with the city of God is different. Living here is part of my identity. Is everybody here black? The majority. Majority, yeah. The city of God is considered one of the blackest neighborhoods in Rio de Janeiro. But even here in a black neighborhood, it is a smaller population of lighter people who have the best opportunities in life. In Brazil, we are not allowed to talk about this. We have to live in a racial democracy that doesn't exist. There is no equality. When I landed in Brazil, I first went to um, <clears throat> Bahia, and I thought, this Brazil is a land of the brown people. Uh -huh. But when I go to hotels, restaurants, look at magazines, uh -huh. no black people. <laughs> Me, I'm the only black people when I go to the hotels, I look like. You, because of your social standing, because of the places you are able to visit in Bahia, there will be many places where you will be the only black man and you could still be badly treated. So, have you been treated bad? Many times. Before, during and after fame. Why is Brazil so racist? Uh, when it's the second largest black nation in the world after Nigeria. Brazil foi um dos. Brazil was one of the last countries to abolish slavery. And since then, we have lived under the myth of a racial democracy. But this democracy is exposed as a lie when we look at the color of the people who live in favelas, the color of the people who are in prison, the color of most of the people who live from crime. People will tell you that our problem in Brazil is an economic problem, a social problem, anything except racial. It can never be racial, but it is. Listening to MV Bill makes me see Brazil in a radically different way. Brazil never had formal segregation, and any form of official racism was made illegal 70 years ago. But it also has never had a massive civil rights movement. Could it be that the illusion of racial democracy prevented such a movement from developing? Was racial democracy ever anything more than official propaganda intended to keep black people in their place? I've come to ask a man who has been fighting for black rights for three quarters of a century. Augusta. 
Age 96, Abdias Nascimento is a writer, a painter, a professor, and was once a senator. He's Brazil's greatest black activist and intellectual. What an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much for seeing me. I've wanted to ask you for a long time, has Brazil ever truly had a racial democracy like it has always claimed to be? Um, and if it's a racial democracy today? This is a joke which has been built up since Brazil was discovered. And Brazil likes to spread this around the world. It's a huge lie. And the black people know this. The black people feel in their flesh the lie, which is racial democracy in this country. You just have to look at a black family. Where do they live? To the black children. How are they educated? You will see that it's all a lie. He must understand that I am saying this with profound hatred, profound bitterness of the way black people are treated in Brazil. Because it's shameful that a country which has a majority of blacks, the majority who built this country, should remain up to this day as second-class citizens. Are you optimistic about the future of race relations in Brazil? If I weren't an optimist, I'd have killed myself. This action is so repetitive. This thing that has been going on for 500 years. So, if I weren't an optimist, I would have hung myself. hopes of Afro-Brazilians for profound changes in race relations rest in part with the country's universities. In 2003, the State University of Rio de Janeiro became the first educational institution in the country to introduce Brazil's version of affirmative action. It declared that 20% of its places would be set aside for black students. Será que a gente também não está mascarando um problema muito mais profundo? E será que se o objetivo é acabar com o racismo, será que a gente não está reforçando isso ah, é, ao contrário, né? Não é uma forma de mascarar o racismo, é uma forma de, de mostrar que, não, que a gente está tentando re se retratar, porque durante 400 anos o negro foi escravizado e quando foi abolido ele foi excluído. Other public universities have also adopted the quota system, some at even higher proportions, up to 40% for poor and black applicants. Guaranteeing a set number of places for black students is still highly controversial. O papel da universidade pública, eu acho que é agrupar toda toda parte da sociedade, todas as partes da sociedade. O papel da universidade pública não é apenas atender a, uma, a elite. Antes de colocar, eu queria que ele enumerasse esses privilégios que ele diz que os brancos têm, porque na questão da universidade eu não vejo o branco como privilegiado, mas sim o negro ou a pessoa de baixa renda por poder optar pelo sistema de cotas ou não. Eu posso te ajudar. É que você falou que não sabia dos privilégios. No ensino superior, 1% dos professores, dos docentes são negros. Então o privilégio é todo dos brancos. É, os negros, com a mesma titulação, com o mesmo grau de escolaridade que os brancos, ganham em média 35% menos ocupando o mesmo cargo. É, você quer mais... Critics say affirmative action only increases racial tension by forcing Brazilians to assert their racial identity in a country where color is supposed to be irrelevant. But supporters say it's the only way black Brazilians will ever become lawyers, doctors and professors in proportion to their percentage of the population. And this will be the first step on the long road to true social equality. The class of 1966 at Yale University had six black men to graduate. The class that entered with me three years later had 96 black men and women, all because of affirmative action. Without affirmative action, I would never have gone to Yale. Without affirmative action, 
Barack Obama wouldn't have gotten into Columbia and wouldn't have gotten into Harvard Law School. Brazil's only hope for achieving its vision of racial democracy is the institutionalization of affirmative action. For decades, Brazil has lived with the myth that it was a racial paradise. Black Brazilians were told that there was no need to demand equal rights because officially, racism didn't exist. But it takes more than the repetition of a colorful phrase to wipe out the legacy of almost 500 years of slavery and a century of racial discrimination. By finally acknowledging that racism does exist, and always has, Brazil is finally embarking on the road to achieving genuine racial democracy. On my journey through Brazil, I wanted to see how racially mixed this country truly is. So I asked each of my interviewees to take a DNA test, which would measure their racial ancestry. It's not a representative sample, but the results are quite striking. Professor João Hayes might look white, but it turns out that he's 10% African and 5% Native American. Rapper M.V. Bill is 18% European and 11% Native American, 71% African. And Professor Vlamira Albuquerque is far more European than she is African. 54% of her DNA comes from Europe, and only 38% from Africa. So in one sense, Gilberto Ferrer was right. Brazil truly is a hybrid nation, right down to its genes. Find out more about how the people of Latin America embrace their African history. Visit pbs.org. To order Black and Latin America on DVD for $29.99 or to pre-order the companion book for $26.95, call 1-800-336-1917 or write to the address on your screen. <laughs>